Hi, can everyone hear me? If you can hear me in the back, can you raise your hand? Great, thank you. Wow. Now 10 jumping jacks, please. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the title of our session today is Changing the Tires at 60 Miles Per Hour, How Martha Stewart Living Omni Media Migrated to Drupal. My name's Ira Tao. I'm the VP of Internet Technology at Martha Stewart Living Omni Media. And in today's presentation, we are going to talk about how we spent the last two years migrating from our old legacy CMS system, which was on Vignette V7, or as some people like to refer to it as VCM, to a brand new infrastructure and implementation built on Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. So we're gonna be talking about moving data, deploying code, our content model, workflow customizations, specialized theme management, and dealing with a high traffic website on Drupal 6. We're gonna be doing a broad technical overview, so we're not gonna be delving too deeply in any one specific area, because obviously we wanna cover as much as possible. But we are here all week, and we certainly love to talk about this stuff. We like lots of questions, so anything that you wanna learn more about, please approach any of us and feel free to ask us anything you'd like. And if you feel you're in the wrong session, which happens, we are not insulted, please feel free to go and find another session while you still have the chance. So I'm gonna put up our Twitter hashtag while I introduce my team. To my right is John Reynolds. John is the AVP of Internet and CMS Internet, CMS, and application development. Next to him is Christopher Winholm, who is our manager of CMS development. Mark Dorison is our manager of application development. Terrence Petrie, or TJ as we like to call him, is our manager of front end development. And our special guest star today is James Sansbury, also known as Corbin of Lullabot fame. <laughs> So, to be clear, we are talking about three websites today. MarthaStewart.com, MarthaStewartWeddings.com, and WholeLiving.com. And each of them are running on a Pressflow installation using Drupal 6 multi-sites. Um, just some quick stats. We serve during our off-peak season, which basically is January through October, approximately seven to 10 million page views a day. Uh, during our high season, which as you can imagine, begins like two weeks before Halloween and goes through, I guess, the day after Christmas, we serve somewhere between 10 and 14 million page views a day. So the first question one would ask, why? Why would we undertake such an endeavor? Well. It really boiled down to our old CMS, and I'm not gonna you know, go into too much detail around that, but I will tell you that there's a whole laundry list of reasons why we didn't like our old CMS. But the bottom line is, is that it couldn't support our business. It couldn't support the initiatives that we needed to undertake to keep up with the changing world and the changing environment out there. And of course, Drupal is awesome. So, how did we wrap our, our heads around a project of this magnitude? The first question that we needed to ask ourselves really was, what are we building? When we started, we had no idea what the front end vision was to be. Our business owners were still trying to figure that out, our design people were still trying to figure that out. We knew that there would be some design tweaks from the existing website, but we weren't sure what those would be. What we did know was that it wouldn't be a full-on redesign. So we thought, okay, great, we're at a terrific advantage here. We can build something really cool, something totally abstract from the inside out with absolutely no requirements that can handle anything. Well, the disadvantage of that is we didn't know what we were building. So it was very difficult to contain the scope and we still needed to prioritize, 
strategize, organize, dice and slice this project into digestible and in implementable units that actually made sense. We also knew that we wanted to embrace agile methodologies as much as possible, which was very, very new to the company. We had no experience at Martha Stewart with Agile whatsoever. So while everyone was deciding what they wanted, we decided to go ahead and just take some action. And we started by looking at our old CMS and documenting all of our content types and taking a full content inventory of what existed on the site. We also documented the functionality at a high level, what each page did, what each content type was responsible for. We analyzed our internal processes. We looked at how people worked. We looked at how data flowed around the organization and how it was organized and how people managed it on a day-to-day -day basis. We also engaged the experts. Not only has James been with our project since the very start, but a big shout out goes to the wonderful and talented Karen Stevenson, who was with us from day one, as well as Eric Duran, Seth Brown, Matt Westgate and Jeff Robbins. And we also need to uh, acknowledge that North Point Solutions was our partner as well in this project. So a big thank you goes to Jeff Penner, Rich Cooley, and Matt Dorman. So the way we proceeded from this point was to create what we called vertical and horizontal subprojects. Now, what does that mean? So what we consider a vertical project is something that is related to very focused functionality or a content type. Recipes, photo galleries, channel landing pages, things that can be described in very discrete ways. What we considered horizontal subprojects were things that we knew had to span across each and every one of those other subprojects. So ad integration, omniture integration, social actions, workflow, these are just examples. And we had this huge grid that represented all of the sub-projects of our entire larger replatforming project. So the next really critical part of our analysis phase was drawing a roadmap towards actually doing this, actually getting content functionality off of one legacy CMS platform and onto the new one. Um, so. In this part of the analysis, we, we regarded these, these considerations and facts. One is we wanted to show continuous progress. Uh, we wanted to and we were, um, we were compelled to by our constituents. They, we didn't want to go off into a cave and build something and emerge you know, a few years later as heroes and liberators. That generally doesn't work too well. So we wanted to continuously uh, put stuff into production and let everybody know it, publicize it. Um, we also wanted to very early on socialize Drupal internally. We wanted the editors to see the interface. We wanted to be completely transparent. Um, this was, again, part of, you know, sort of a cultural um, coup to get buy-in on, on the project. We needed to mitigate risk. So Ira mentioned the page views that we get. There's ads on those pages. We're really not allowed to have any downtime. It can obviously impact revenue, uh, impact the user experience, impact the editorial flow. So we needed to, tr to have some kind of strategy that would make sure that that happened as little as possible or not at all. Uh, we want to keep the developers psyched. Again, this goes into the going to a cave is, is no fun for developers. Nobody likes to think they're working on vaporware. So we wanted to continually kind of bias into the whole idea of continuous progress, keeping the developers energized by keeping their work going into production. And we wanted to keep the people who are writing the checks happy. This is part of any project, I think. Um, so all of this led us to an inevitable conclusion, which is we had no illusions that we could simply forklift, forklift, the forklift. <laughs> one site from one platform to another, and this picture of a forklift illustrates that point. <laughs> so what we decided to do was migrate iteratively, and this kind of became the rallying cry for the project, iterative, iterative, iterative. So what does that mean? That means we resolved to maintain both platforms, Drupal and Vignette. We resolved to move one content at a time from the old platform to the new while keeping both stacks up and running. And finally, all the stuff we don't know. Um, we knew that there would be, the load balancer would play a critical role in balancing between those two platforms. We knew redirects would be involved. Did we have everything figured out at the very beginning? As much as we could, but no, and we just decided that was okay. Hey, we're agile now, so um, we, we had enough faith in the premise that we wanted to move it forward. So with that, um, we were ready to start actually building the site and migrating data, 
and my colleagues are going to talk about that. I'm going to come back a little bit later and talk about how we actually, uh, what happened when we really started routing traffic to that dual platform system. Hi, so when I first joined the team, there was a lot of homework that had already been done, and I can't stress that enough, that even though we were working iteratively and weren't really quite sure what our final product was going to be, uh, there was a lot of research that had gone into this, um, a lot of inventory taking, the content types had been studied, and I was part of a team that worked on documenting all that, what fields do we have in each content type, what fields do we want in our final model as far as we know now, although that's going to change. Um, so it came time to actually start to dig in. And um, when you're ready to go, start going right away. Don't wait till the time that you have to like actually be in your new apartment. Start figuring out how you want to move way before. So I would say start migrating this data as soon as you can. And what we ended up doing was we would start migrating the data differently as the needs of the developers changed. We would find that we needed a feature to be different on the front end, um, or we would need a piece of data that we didn't think we needed anymore. And what we did uh, by using the migrate module was we were able to just re-migrate content uh, with the data transformations and changes as we needed them. So we were able to actually migrate the data alongside the code iteration. The other thing we really wanted to do was we wanted to keep some kind of view, both for the editors and for the developers, into the legacy data without necessarily having to rely on keeping our old BCM system alive and kicking in some back room somewhere forever and ever and ever. So we wanted to, in some way, be able to hold on to the vital parts of that um, old data model and also be able to understand some of the logic and thinking that had gone into constructing those data models, even though we didn't want them anymore. So we set out, um, as uh, Ira and John said, to come, sort of come up with the big picture, the big dream. How do we really want this to be? And we just went in and created the content types the way that we thought we would want them. And then um, we built what we call a Drupal 6 data bridge. We called it the ECL, the Enterprise Content Library. And so we set up uh, a separate Drupal 6 instance that was going to sit in between the old legacy content system and the Drupal 6 instance that was going to be our actual production sites for our users. And we relied heavily on the Migrate module and a lot of the work I want to give a shout out to Mike Ryan here who backported some XML functionality uh, from D7 into D6 for us and um, taught me maybe one one hundredth of what he knows about Migrate and migrations. Um, so the schema of this, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, is we see too many charts in these kind of conferences all the time. Basically on the left side here, uh, we have two services that present XML data, one from our recipe database in the middle there, we had about 60,000 recipes. Um, we set up a service from the old BCM data, also in XML format, um, and using the migrate module, we mapped those into this uh, intermediate enterprise content library Drupal 6 instance. We also had a, you know, years and years and years and years of high quality photographs that we wanted to migrate in as well and keep track of. Um, and through uh, scanning the IPTC data of that, this is something that's in progress right now. We're trying to get a lot of the metadata for those images into this Drupal 6 uh, instance. What this um, middle layer was allowed us to do would be basically to hold on to a lot of the uh, unique IDs, um, old legacy data about when something was created, uh, who created it, things that we didn't necessarily think we would need in the final product and actually would r rather remove, but it allowed us to keep it and refer back to it, and it was a resource for in future iterations of our migration, we might decide, oh, actually, we do need that thing. Um, and then we had another whole set of migrations that we wrote from that Drupal 6 instance out to the Drupal 6 magazines platform where we serve MarthaStewart.com, WholeLiving.com, and MarthaStewartWeddings.com. So some of the things that we learned about this was we spent a lot of time going backwards and forwards trying to figure out where did this come from, where did this go, um, and we really needed a way uh, to very easily, without having to fire off SQL queries every day, um, 20, 30 times a day, to figure out where did this come from, where is it going, why didn't it go where I thought it would go. Um, so what we ended up doing was we created little widgets in our UI that allowed editors and uh, developers to very quickly be able to see where something came from and where it went. So here you can see a little widget in the enterprise content library system that uh, 
would tell us what node was created and on which site from a certain piece of content. And on the front end system in the production websites, we created a little widget with uh, a, the UUID of the item um, that had been migrated in from the ECL. And that's, of course, a clickable link that would take you back to that item in the ECL if you wanted to view it there. There's also a link underneath it that you can't quite see, which would actually take you all the way, in this case, this is a recipe, it would take you all the way back to our original recipe content um, database. So the second thing is that we learned, uh, we sort of knew this from the outset, but it was certainly made very clear to me as we worked along, and I think Mike can concur with this, that the content types are very iterative. Um, the demands of your data, what you think you're gonna need, uh, something that you thought you didn't need at all is gonna suddenly become vital. Um, something that you thought was vital to have is gonna become junk. Um, so don't hold on to that original data model too much in the very beginning. Um, a real blessing that revealed itself to us uh, through this was by using the real data as soon as possible. Uh, bugs and bad assumptions in our uh, uh, consumer-facing application logic became apparent much quicker. Uh, real data is much messier and dirtier than anything that the Debella module can generate for you um, or any sample data that you're going to type in because you're going to type in any data with the assumptions of the programmer already in mind. But real data is messy. It's, you know, you've got 10 years of people trying to work around a content management system um, by customizing titles or introducing line breaks. And that stuff is going to be really helpful to you. The sooner you can see it, it's going to be really helpful to you in sort of resolving issues that you didn't expect coming along. Um, and the migrate modules are wonderful. Uh, they're really powerful. Um, but uh, they're very complicated to work with. You definitely want people who are very familiar with object-oriented programming, and they're resources in resource intensive. We were definitely bumping up the memory limit of PHP often to make these things run. So uh, we've got a process now for iterating our data models through our launch, um, but we also are gonna be deploying this code very frequently. Uh, the target would be you know, once a week or once every two weeks, so we needed a framework for deploying this stuff. So we wanted to do it the same way every time because we wanted to have faith and trust and not have to feel like we were reinventing each deployment every time we did it. Um, and we also wanted to minimize the steps that we would have to take after deploying the new code to the website. You know, like, go, don't go to this admin form and click on this button and save this. We wanted to get rid of all that stuff. Um, we also wanted to be able to deploy content configuration without changing the content since our editors were going to be working directly on the production site. So we looked at a bunch of tools that are out there and without wanting to disparage any of them, none of them really were going to meet our needs and that's a long topic that I'm happy to talk about at some other point. Uh, and Drupal is making a lot of progress in general uh, in this direction. Uh, but we ended up sort of throwing together our own deployment solution uh, based on some tools out there and also writing our own tools. So we wrote a tool called Bower, which is a uh, bash shell script, which basically is a wrapper um, that calls on Fing, which is an ant-like XML uh, application deployment tool. Um, but it's written in PHP, which allowed us to use the resources and the knowledge that we already had on our PHP uh, expert staff uh, to customize it. And then we wrote a bunch of custom Drush commands. Uh, and also, I might mention, we named Bower, um, it's Dutch for builder in a little tribute to Dries. So um, we decided to use features in order to capsulate changes in the data model, uh, changes in permissions, changes in views, and uh, also to be able to export configuration and deploy configuration. We uh, tried to use C tools and exportables as often as possible everywhere we could. Uh, we reserved the update hooks for schema changes. And then, of course, source code management. Uh, in our enterprise, we decided that Git uh, would be the right solution, and we uh, ended up using the GitFlow model, which John Reynolds here will be happy to talk to you about later. Uh, so how do we create a Bower release? Basically, it's three very simple commands. Um, first, you create the release package. You type in Bower seed, and I have platform and version. Platform, well, we had three Drupal instances running. We had the enterprise content library, we had the uh, consumer-facing uh, Drupal instance, and then we also had a D7 instance, which James will talk about later for our user content. So uh, we needed to know which platform we were deploying. So Bower Seed 
let's say, uh, the name of the platform and the version that you want to seed. And what that would do is it would create a release package, um, which would be a release branch in Git, and a state for modules enabled, which modules were disabled, uh, some other sort of relevant information about that, sort of meta information about that release package. Then you can tweak that and change those save, uh, make those changes, save those changes, commit those back into Git, and when you say Bower save, all that is wrapped back up and sent up back into the origin source code management tool. And then you are ready to deploy. Um, and when you deploy on a dev environment or when you deploy in a QA environment, something different happens than when you deploy on live. There are certain special hooks that are enacted when you go into the live deployment. So it's, it's context aware. Uh, it always knows if I'm on the live server, I have to dis disable the debel modules, for example. Um, and that's that. And we would continue to use the same, um, the same deployment model uh, for all of our releases throughout the cycle. So one of the things we learned from this is by, by sticking to using the same uh, release cycle and the same deployment tools, there was a lot more confidence in our releases. Uh, less nail biting, less nervousness. Um, the second thing that was good about it was it allowed our developers to actually develop their code towards a deployment. They knew what was expected of a finished feature. They're working on a new uh, part of the site and it's not just I've written my functions. No, have you also wrapped this up in features? Have you enabled the permissions and saved those? Uh, is this something that is deployable with our deployment model? So it really kind of enforced a tighter coding standard on our developers and I think it also gave them more confidence that what they did uh, in their code was actually going to be represented on the live site correctly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with Drupal 6, we still can't capture every configuration detail. On some of our releases, we did have to, you know, do some manual post deployment steps. Uh, so it's not perfect, but we, I would say nine times out of ten, we were able to do our deployments uh, without any other further interaction. And unfortunately, still, the, you know, the, the holy grail is to do a real true rollback in Drupal. We uh, gave up on that. We tried, um, and so we're, we do a, a database backup before we do any deployment. So we knew that there were two main structural problems that we needed to solve when we were building out the structure of our site. Uh, the first thing was the hierarchical nature of our content. Uh, Whereas many sites might have a article node with a image file attached to it, uh, what's more likely in our case is we have a gallery node, which node references a recipe node, which node references an image node, and then that image node would have many uh, different image crops attached to it. So here we can see an example of a recipe node, and you see a delicious looking cookie uh, on the left hand side. So that's actually, we're looking at a recipe node which is referencing an image node and there's an image file attached to that. Here we're looking at the same uh, recipe node but this time displayed in a gallery. And so we built a number of tools for our editors to be able to you know, see where all this content was being used. Uh, on the top, uh, we have that first recipe node and we're seeing all the different places that that content is being referenced throughout the site. And on the bottom, we see the same uh, interface for the gallery node that we just looked at. So the editors have a clear picture of where all this stuff is being uh, presented to our users and can uh, and make good use of that. So the other problem that we needed to solve uh, was something that most of us learned very quickly when we started at Martha Stewart, that there's no breaking news at Martha Stewart. All of our content is evergreen. So, you know, most of us have built plenty of Drupal sites where we've created lots of views, and most of them, or many of them, were sorting by date descending. But here, that's not really the case. That recipe, that cookie recipe, is going to be just as delicious today as it was six months ago. And we want to make sure that our editors have the power to use that. So, what we did was we created promotional content items. So these are actual separate content types whose sole purpose is to reference and present other content. Here's an example of three different ones displayed on our homepage. And I should mention that each one of those uh, links on the left-hand column and many in the center are node references to our, what we consider real content, our recipes, our articles, our galleries. Here's a channel page, uh, our holiday channel, getting ready for Easter and another promotional content item, we call them touts, 
And this one just themed differently as a gallery. And one more, the same thing, just themed differently. So when we were trying to figure out how do we give the editors control to place this stuff on the page, um, the first thing we did was we looked at how our pages are laid out. It's pretty straightforward, three column system, common to many sites, so we made a grid. And we created blocks, uh, we placed blocks using context, and those blocks are powered through views um, for each one of those uh, sections in the grid. Um, then we needed to have the ability for editors to actually put content in those items, in those uh, blocks in the grid. So we looked at three different ways to do this. Uh, the first was node references. We use them everywhere else on the site, so why not here? Um, it seemed like a straightforward idea, but the problem that we ran into was that for every time an editor wanted to place a piece of content there, they'd have to edit two nodes. They'd have to create the content item, save it, and then they would have to go and edit this channel page and change the node reference to point to that content, piece of content that they just created. So we threw this idea out pretty quickly because we didn't want to have that two-step workflow. Uh, the second thing that we looked at was panels. Every time that we described this problem to someone, they said, this sounds like panels. So we prototyped it, and it worked very well for what we wanted to do. Uh, but the one shortcoming that we found was that some of our editors are very non-technical, so we weren't 100% comfortable with putting them in the panel's uh, UI. So the solution that we came up with was what we call weak references. So if a node reference is a strong reference, if you have a, a direct point piece of data in the database pointing from one node to another, a weak reference is, is just uh, one piece of data that two content items share. So in this case, we use taxonomy. So as an example of that, you can see here uh, the edit screen for one of our touts, the promo content. And we move in and we can look at the two uh, important pieces uh, to get one of those tout pieces of content onto the page. So an editor selects a channel, uh, which it shares that piece of content with the channel page, and then they select a position. So which spot do they want to show up in center column position two, right column position three? So once they do that and save, views takes care of the rest. There's a display for that each individual position and it pulls in the correct one that they, wanna, they want to show up there. So what did we take away from all this? Uh, node references are super powerful. They allow you to build amazing experiences uh, through those connections to your content. So we can bubble things up and on a recipe show all of the galleries that that recipe is uh, referenced in. They're also very expensive. Uh, not such a big deal when you're loading a recipe node. Uh, we reference the image and we load that, no big deal. But when you're loading one of our gallery nodes, you could potentially be having to load hundreds of nodes just to generate that gallery experience. The pieces of content that it's referencing and the images that it, those are referencing all the way down the line. They also create caching issues. So just like it's very simple, uh, you know, previously for a recipe, um, for node references, it's also very straightforward. You edit a recipe, clear that recipe from cache. But where else is that recipe being displayed? Is it being referenced on the home page, a channel page? Is it in a gallery? So we had to figure out how do we handle the caching challenges with this. And lastly, blocks and context uh, require a bit of strategic planning. We you know, experimented with it. We found that the best solution for us was to have many uh, more specific contexts than uh, larger ones. So we have many different specific contexts that all lay these blocks out on the page. So next we're gonna talk about how our editors and producers work with the content on a day-to-day -day basis. As Mark mentioned, all of our content is curated. It's evergreen. That article from last Thanksgiving about how to carve a turkey is gonna be just as relevant this coming Thanksgiving as it was last year. Also, um, our brand is known for attention to detail and quality, and it was incumbent on us to enable our editors and producers to create those visual experiences as they saw fit and as they felt their special needs required. So um, content at Martha Stewart, as I'm sure at many other places, but content goes through many, many different rounds of edits and is touched by many people before it is actually published. The pipeline that we created needed to have the ability to 
edit, create and edit content, and have that piece of content be touched by editors, photo editors, video editors, copy editors, producers, senior editors, and anyone else you might be able to think of. So we needed a way to keep it organized and provide the correct visibility to our senior editorial staff so that they could keep track of what was going on and what was scheduled to, to publish or what was moving around the system. We also took on the, uh, you know, the responsibility on our own to make sure that the permissions for the nodes changed at every step along the way because we wanted to make sure that nobody was stepping on each other's work. We also needed the ability to schedule publish in advance and to make sure that things could go out on an automated schedule. But a little bit more um, you know, uh, tricky was creating the ability to edit content that was already live, leave it as it is, have it go through that same workflow again, and then ultimately, when it's published, replace the live version. So there were a lot of requirements around our editorial UI and our workflow system. So to accomplish this, we basically went to the community, as many do, and started out with the workflow suite of modules. Um, we started out with workflow. We did lots of customization. And the important point that I would like to make about that is that all the customization that we did around workflow, and it's probably the most customization that we've done across um, any contrib modules that we're, that we're using, is that we did it the Drupal way. We did not change a single line of code from the contrib modules. We did everything with alters. We made sure to have an upgrade path, that we weren't boxing ourselves out from future versions of the, of the workflow module. So the modules that we used were workflow, workflow access, module grants, revisioning, and we also wrote a little custom module of our own that we call the Workbin. So to illustrate this, I'm going to show a typical node. This is, uh, happens to be a, uh, a photo gallery that we have on our site. But let's look behind this node at the node edit screen. So I'd like you to take notice of the upper right and see that this user is logged in as editor, editor sample. And the tabs across the top of this node edit screen represent the workflow that this node will probably travel through as it moves from draft to production. Also, this node is in draft state at this moment. So when the user is done editing this content and ready to save the node, and they move on to the workflow screen, you'll notice that the, that the user has basically two choices here they can push it forward to another workflow state like top edit or copy edit, or they can basically leave it in draft. But the editor does not have the ability to publish this node, and that's by design. Now let's look at the same exact node, but this time the editor is logged in as copy editor. Well, the copy editor has a different set of permissions associated with his or her role. And the copy editor on the workflow tab, therefore, has more choices. They can push it backward in the workflow, or they can push it to be published. We also um, wanted to create the ability to assign nodes to individuals rather than just roles. So what we're seeing here is one of our custom uh, UIs, which is the ability to assign this node to a user rather than just a role. And what this, what this interface is, does, it basically allows you to assign it to any user that has permissions to the role, I'm sorry, has permissions to the node that is currently in this workflow state, uh, send a message, send an email, and, uh, and save the node. So then what happens? The node goes into what we call the work bin. And the work bin is the bird's eye view of all the content that's in our system that's neither in draft nor in published state. So anything that's in between appears on this screen. And if you notice, the tab on top says in workflow. And the exposed filters allow you to search based on lots of different criteria so that you can actually locate the content that you're look looking for. The next tab is the work bin. 
So this basically assigns, this shows content that is assigned to the logged in user. And so, so as an editor or a producer, I come to work, I turn on my computer, I go directly to this screen and I see what content is waiting for me to work on. The third tab, the third tab is the schedule to publish tab. And this shows work that has gone through its workflow and is about to be made live on the site um, and about to be made, uh, about to be published. So, you know, this is used by our editors a lot so that they understand what changes are going to appear on the live site. So, what we learned through all of this is that, first and foremost, Drupal permissions are very, very complex. And they're very complex most specifically when they're dealing with the differences between authenticated versus anonymous users. So if you're attempting or if you want to attempt to do any type of customization around workflow, I really recommend that you look at the node access function in the node module and understand it very, very precisely because the way Drupal treats nodes and their permissions can get a little unruly. The workflow module is very powerful, and I'm using the word unruly again, but you'll forgive me for that. Um, we solved special cases with hooks. Uh, there's just no other way to do it in, in Drupal, and you will save yourself hours and hours of heartache if you follow this one simple rule. The workflow module itself happens to use Drupal Actions um, a lot. We decided to work around that, and instead of using Drupal Actions, we put everything in code, simply because that enabled us to have a greater degree of granular control over what would happen across workflow transitions. But most importantly, we suggest to learn how people work. Um, find out what they need versus what they want get continuous input from your users on what you are building, mitigate risk by not making too many assumptions um, because after all, they know their jobs better than you know their jobs, so they are the experts in what they need. And as we all know, happy users that feel like they've been heard, at the end of the day, make us all feel happy. Thanks, Ira. So we can see there's a whole lot of great stuff uh, about what's going on in the back end, but what about the front end? Um, as Ira had mentioned earlier, there really wasn't much of an overall design strategy at the time when we went and set forth on this, this replatforming project. Um, so the collective decision was made to maintain the look and feel, because after all, this was a, uh, a replatforming effort, not, a, not necessarily a redesign effort. Um, so to set forth on this, the easiest way that, that we could go about it was, or the way that I could think of it, was just to recycle the old code. Uh, the markup in the CSS has already been created for us. It didn't, seem, uh, it didn't seem like it was worth our while to actually recreate all of the markup and all of the CSS. So uh, basically, we just used the same CSS. The, the file still lives somewhere, so we could access those files and just point them, use, our, use Drupal to point them to those same files. And then uh, using the, the, the templates that were created in Vignette, we use those as, a, as, as the starting point to, to pretty much try to duplicate that output uh, within Drupal. Um, it, it wasn't a, a super easy effort, but uh, along the way, uh, our design team found some opportunities to be able to kind of freshen up some of the designs that we've had from the older legacy system. Uh, in the midst of that, this is actually, this is an example of, an, of, a, of one of our older recipe pages. This is our recipe content type. Uh, and when I say uh, uh, an example of a freshened up design, this is the same recipe page, just with that, the freshened up version. Uh, so you can see that a lot of the styles are exactly the same when it comes to the, the main nav and all the global elements. Some of the colors are the same, the background's the same. So this kind of this kind of became a little difficult. We had to figure out a way that we could shoehorn this, this freshened up design into uh, the, 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 the idea that we've been going along with the whole time. So uh, the best way that we could do this was to introduce something that we would call the, the transitional theme. Now, the transitional theme isn't exactly the theme that you're normally used to in the Drupal world. Uh, the transitional theme is something that we had to use in order to, uh, to we, have, we have content types that needed to exist in both 
our old legacy format still, but we also needed to utilize the same content types in this new transitional theme version. Uh, on the left right here is, a, is one of the legacy designs with the, the blue header. Uh, and on the right is, uh, is the exact same content type. This is one of the content types that Mark was discussing earlier. These, these are one of our tout blocks. Um, so this needed to exist in both the freshened up designs and both in the, uh, in the, the legacy designs. So what this transitional theme does is uh, basically it's just a function. It, uh, it checks the node type and it returns whether or not it's transitional. Uh, if it is transitional, it'll add and remove a lot of front end components or switch certain things that need to happen uh, along the way. Uh, we did explore the, the, the idea of creating a, an actual theme for it, but at the time we had so many themes that we were juggling uh, it didn't seem, it didn't seem, uh, it seemed like a little bit too much to manage for this little bit of functionality that we needed to incorporate. Uh, another directive that came along was that we needed to have forward compatible images. We have a, a, a great image team that, that works tirelessly to, uh, to crop and optimize and in, in, in work on all of the different, the, the, the enormous giant image library that we have. Uh, and we needed a way to take care of all of that stuff that was already being created and also find a way to automate some of the, the images that needed to be created in the future. Uh, when we first began in the, in the vignette content management system, uh, each image uh, person would, would, would uh, crop and optimize all of these types of images. So we began with like small, medium, and large type images. And then we moved on to some video images with different size video images. And as, as needs grew, we actually moved into uh, iPhone and some shop images and then HD images came along, and then after a while, it ended up being over four, 14 <coughs> image crops for each image, and these were all hand done by our image team. So that didn't that didn't really seem like that it was that uh, that it was that, it was that easy. It, was, it wasn't that it wasn't scalable. It wasn't something that we can continue doing. Uh, so we needed to find a way to make that a little bit easier for our image team. So we introduced the uh, the image content type and a little bit of custom image caching. Right now, we're down to only three crops. And, uh, and this makes our image team a, a lot happier. But basically what we've used, the, the image content type, so now we're able to reference all of those legacy images that have been imported. And we can also use the, we can also reference, reference some of the newer images that have also been created. Uh, the custom image caching, basically what it does is it determines the image type. So if it determines that that image type is a legacy image type, we can go ahead and serve that image because it's already been cropped and optimized for viewing. Uh, and if, it's, if, it's, if it hasn't been, then we can use some custom image caching to take one of these crops and image cache it down to the, the size and specs that we need to display it as. Uh, some of the takeaways from this is that uh, pre-processing is pretty expensive. Uh, to mimic a lot of the markup that came out from the vignette content management system, we had to take a lot of that data and kind of crunch it down and mold it and do it, what we needed to do with it to copy a lot of that ID and class structure. Um, and to, to Segue into two, a lot of that, a lot of that, re, a lot of the stuff that we have in template.php that we've done in preprocessors is pretty complex, and it's it probably should have belonged in the uh, in the module layer. So I would I would advocate for avoiding a lot of complex theme logic, and uh, the third one I, that's I believe is probably kind of un unavoidable, but uh, but managing a lot of parent a, a lot of multiple parent and sub themes with multiple inherited styles and still supporting our legacy system can be tricky. And, uh, and I, I don't really know any other way around of how we did it, but, uh, but I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. We're not done yet because we've done a lot of great stuff. Like we've migrated all this data out of this old system and we created a new Drupal stacks with new content types pushed all the data in there and we created amazing workflows for our editors and we made it all beautiful. But only we care because no one has seen it yet. We haven't presented any of, this, uh, any of the Drupal pages to the public. So now it was time to actually light it up and let people see our, our, our great work on Drupal. Um, so I'm gonna harken back to my earlier, what I was saying earlier about our, our roadmap, our early plan. We were gonna maintain those two CMSs in parallel and move stuff from the old to the new. Well, as we're doing that in any given situation, how do we know if the given URL is supposed to be served from Drupal or from Vignette. And even that guy doesn't know. Uh, so the first, the first piece of the puzzle was obviously the load balancer was critically important. And for us, uh, this, was, this was actually really simple. Um, I'll tell you why. We got a little lucky uh, because the, uh, what you're looking at here is an actual, an actual URL of a Martha Stewart recipe on the old system. The Vignette URL structure we had was content type slash title. 
Um, our SEO business analysts wanted us, want us to change that for reasons I won't enumerate here to uh, node ID slash title when we move stuff over to Drupal. So um, we got, this is why we got lucky, and you might not get so lucky, but in the vignette system, no URL started with a number. So we just created a load balancer rule that said if the URL starts with a number, send it to Drupal. Otherwise, like in the case of this one, it's a vignette URL by default, so send it to vignette. So the load balancer part was pretty easy. There was some fine tuning, but that rule got us like a huge part of the way. So the next piece of the puzzle was redirects. Obviously, we're going to have to create a lot of redirects. And um, as we rolled, say, a content type like recipes, it's time to serve that from Drupal instead of vignette. We were faced with, OK, we've got to create a redirect. For every vignette recipe URL, we have to create a redirect to the corresponding Drupal URL. So we used the path redirect module. Anybody know this module? It's a popular module. Anybody love this module as much as we do? So the path redirect module is an incredibly simple and powerful module. It stores the source and the target of your redirect and the, and the, um, the status code, usually 301 or 302. And, it'll, and then Drupal will actually perform the redirect. And it actually will also, you know, you can go in the node edit form and create a redirect right there. So we started with that, but that wasn't good enough. And here we have an example of a, a Drupal, UR, uh, Drupal URL being, or vignette URL being redirected to Drupal URL. Um, but we had a problem. We didn't want all of those redirects to be processed by Drupal because we have a lot of traffic and we didn't want to have the performance problem that we incurred from all those redirect requests coming to our um, Drupal uh, infrastructure. So we partnered up with Akamai, who is our content delivery network partner. And uh, we said, what, what can you do to help us here? And they crafted a solution for us where we export all those redirect rules from path redirect, convert them and r sync them up to Akamai, and Akamai actually ends up performing the redirect. Um, and path redirect module then just becomes the way we actually manage um, the redirect rules themselves. So bring the load balancer back into the picture. Um, as we created those recipe uh, redirect rules, we push them up to Akamai, and now our vignette URL gets redirected by Akamai, turned into a Drupal URL, and the load balancer recognizes it as Drupal, and we launched all the recipes, hooray! And as we did each content type, we would just generate another batch of redirect rules, and that was like the big ceremonial uh, thing that we did to launch a content type. So here comes the special sauce, custom link rendering. So, all right. Um, the first page, so when, this is, this is funny. So you know when you get like carpet cleaner and it says test on an inconspicuous area? And you think, and that's really good advice, right? What page do you think we launched first on Drupal? The home page. We launched the home page first on Drupal. You know why? Because go hard or go home. That's why. <laughs> so, right. So, <laughs> so, but we had a problem, right? Because we launched the home page on Drupal, but everything else is on Vignette. So all the links to all the atomic content on that home page have to point to Vignette. What are we going to do? And what's more, as we start moving content types over to Drupal, those links that were vignette have to magically turn into Drupal links. So here's what we did. We started with a serve from vignette list, literally a list of the content types we were serving from vignette. This was an array, because it's Drupal, got to have an array. So we made an array listing all the content types. It was a comp variable that we stored in each site settings.php file, and we just called it with variable get from module and theme code, anytime we needed to check which content types are served from vignette. And as we started to move stuff off of Drupal, we go, Take that one right out, and then we, as we moved them over, that array eventually became an empty array, which is extremely gratifying. The second ingredient was a CCK field that we put. It was a shared field on all the content types um, that contained the legacy vignette URL that we actually ported over from migration. So Christopher made part of the migration, grabbed the vignette URL, and ported it over into this CCK field on each node. You can see why this is going to be useful. And finally, we had our own custom functions for rendering links, our own custom uh, drop-in replacements for URL and L. Temporary replacements, but replacements nonetheless. So here's another example of a tout you've seen. We've been talking about touts all day long. Um, so Mark mentioned these touts, the links on these touts are created by node references, right? So here's the node that's being referenced, okay? It's this, uh, I'm not even sure what content type it is, but it's, there's the node ID, and there's the URL alias. We're using path modules, everybody does. We have URL aliases. And the vignette URL, which we captured over in migration, is also carried through with the node in that CCK field. So our old friend, the URL function, we all know this function, right? If, you put in, if you've got URL aliases and you put in a string like node slash NID, you're going to get the URL alias back to generate your link if you're using L or URL. Um, we simply just made our own custom URL function that added another check in there. So before you checked it, check that serve from vignette list. Is this node that's being referenced? Is its type on that list? Oh, then grab that path that's in that CCK field and run that through URL instead of node slash NID. 
If it wasn't on the list, just run a node slash NID through and get the Drupal URL. And by doing this, when we took that, those, those content types out of that, that served from vignette array, the links would just change to Drupal. It was automatic. So that was real slick. Takeaways from all of this dual platform stuff. It required a lot of care. I'm making it sound like, you know, it was, we thought of this in an afternoon, but we spent a lot of time mulling over all of the exceptions and weird edge cases. And you really have to think about that stuff. You don't want to be controlled by the edge cases, but you need to factor them in and know what you're up against. And it takes a lot of time to do it right. Um, I mentioned showing continuous project, huge win. I recommend if you're doing a project like this, make sure you're not doing it in a cave and that you're benefiting production either the way that we've described or some other way. But it's a huge win all the way around. Um, having those two things, those two platforms, was not easy. It was expensive. We had to pay for the infrastructure for both Drupal and Vignette. And, um, and there was complexity added as a result of that. We had to write some disposable code like the custom URL function I just mentioned and some other things. We knew this was inevitable. Um, when possible, you want to try to abstract that disposable code into modules or functions that you can find easily later and clean up. Um, but have no illusions that you can write some, you, can't, you can do it without writing some disposable code. And finally, the gradual transition from one platform to the other had pluses. Um, and the, the editors enjoyed it because they got to see the uh, and work with the Drupal interface early and affect its evolution because you can change it with form alters and stuff pretty easily. Editors love that. They couldn't really do that with Vignette. So they got to have a say in how that UI worked. But and the other side was the editors were working in two CMSs. So they'd have to do some stuff in Drupal. And then if they're working on a content type we haven't moved yet, they have to work in Vignette. Pain point, but you know, getting them in, involved with Drupal early was really effective at getting their buy-in and getting their um, enthusiasm and energizing the project. Hold your ears, I'm gonna move the mic. Okay, that wasn't that painful. <laughs> <laughs> so as you've seen, uh, this process has been iterative, um, pretty much touching every layer of the stack. And once we started working on the authenticated experience, there was really no exception there either. The first thing we needed to um, create was a seamless experience. So if someone were to navigate to one of those vignette pages, um, for instance, if a, a recipe was still on vignette, they go there, they log in. Um, and then if they were to navigate to uh, one of the other content types that had been served from Drupal, they should at least appear logged in, right? This was priority number one. We had to get this figured out before we could launch even that first content type. The way we did this at the beginning is on our Drupal 6 side, we had some JavaScript in the page that would perform an AJAX request back to Vignette to retrieve the information about the user. And then in that, um, on that Drupal page, it would just pop that in there. You know, So if it says, hi, James, up at the top, um, you know, it knows my name because it's made that AJAX request back to Vignette. So it at least appears that I'm logged in. Uh, because we did this, this was really awesome in hindsight because it forced us to start thinking about the authenticated experience as a completely separate application. Um, and so once we started uh, working on implementing this in Drupal, we made a really exciting decision to actually use a completely separate Drupal instance for our authenticated experience. Any of you guys familiar with Discuss? So Discuss is like a commenting system. It kind of works the same way, where you've got this separate application for all your comments and everything like that. Um, this was a. Uh, the instance, basically, so we had this instance, it, it contained all the users, all the comments, uh, all the user profile data, um, complete separation of user-generated content, or UGC. And this was a huge win for us, not just in the, um, in the aspect of being able to shard the data, so we have this completely separate database that has all these users and all the content and comments and all that stuff, um, but also just being able to kind of custom tailor these two environments from a security perspective and a performance perspective. Another huge win here was that um, because we had this single instance for all users, um, we could really easily implement single sign-on. So say you go to MarthaStewartWeddings.com, you sign in, you then go to MarthaStewart.com, you're signed in. You've got all the same user profile data. It's across all the different environments. If Martha Stewart adds another brand to this, bam, it's, all the data is already there. One thing we knew we needed to do um, is to create a really feature-rich comment experience. And uh, while we didn't need to do this right away, eventually we needed to um, 
have a way for users to be able to upload images to comments, for users to be able to rate comments, for users to say be able to post their own variation of a recipe. And because of this, we made another really exciting decision uh, to use Drupal 7. Woohoo! Da 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 da! Um, so, Drupal 7 comments are fieldable, so we can create this really customized comment experience really easily in Drupal 7. If we were to try and do the same thing in Drupal 6, not only would we have been adding, probably using nodes to do all this for comments, um, and therefore adding even more nodes into our node table, um, but it, you know, it would just be extremely, extremely complex. So we stood up this separate instance, but how did we get that into our Drupal 6 site, right? We've still got to solve that problem. The way we did this was with iframes and ESIs, or edge side includes. In our Drupal 6 site, we have uh, a module there that just simply prints out ESI tags um, for all the user bits, um, user authenticated experience bits in the page. An ESI tag looks something like this. And what happens at the edge, as a CDN is referred to, is the request for that URL goes back to our Drupal 7 instance. And what the Drupal 7 instance is retur it returns is just simple markup like this, containing links to Drupal 7 pages. A perfect example of this is the sign in and register now links that you see here. So if I were to click on one of those links, you'd actually get a modal window popped up, and that would be the iframe. That I the reason we used iframes here is that way we could completely leverage Drupal 7's Ajax API um, without having to do any of like cross JavaScript between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. The, the Ajax API between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 is completely different, um, and the Drupal 7 Ajax API is awesome. So um, just so you know, if you're clicking around on MarthaStewart.com right now and trying to replicate this, uh, we haven't actually, like I said, this is iterative. We haven't actually launched this yet, but it's, it's a work in progress, and hopefully in a couple weeks um, we'll have this completely done. So, so what did we learn from all this? Um, we created a very complex environment for ourselves. Um, so we've got developers, we've got QA testers, we've got designers, all trying to work with and understand this really, really complicated environment, right? So we needed to calculate in the time for documentation, for communication, and most importantly, for a test-driven development workflow. Um, we, you know, it's really easy to add, like, add, just have regressive bugs with this complicated environment, so. Another thing that we learned is uh, how important it was for the developers and the designers to communicate um, early and often. Um, you know, it's kind of, developers kind of want to go, go off in their own cave and build things in Drupal the way they want to build them, and uh, the de designers kind of want to go in their room and just dream up these beautiful user experiences, um, you know, just beautiful workflows and everything like that. And if there's no communication from the developers saying, hey, this is how Drupal wants to do these things. This is what we can get out of the box. Um, the designers are really just building these things, or you know, dreaming these things up, and there's 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 a disconnect there, right? And it's just going to completely lengthen the the how how long the project takes. So the developers can communicate. The designers, you make compromises, and then we start working towards that goal of what the designers want to do. So, like Ira said. Um, we're, we've only got a minute here, so we don't really have time for questions, but we're going to be here. Because um, there's a half hour now. Oh, we do have time for questions, sorry. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have questions, please come up, um, come up to the microphone. Hi, uh, congratulations, first of all. It sounds like a really uh, successful project. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious, you mentioned you're doing about 10 million page views a day on the, and that's for people logged in and not logged in, is that true? So the, the question is, is the, the 10 million page visits a day, is that um, overall, or is that only for anonymous? Well, that's a combination of both authenticate, is it on? Doesn't seem like it's on. Here, stand up here. Yeah, so that's, that's, an, that's a combination of authenticated as well as non-authenticated users. 
Um, the problem with our old CMS was that it was kind of difficult to create these customized, authenticated, dynamically driven experiences, and that was one of the main drivers that led us to Drupal. So uh, we rely on Akamai a lot for our cache content and our non-authenticated non users, our anonymous users, but we don't expect that we're going to experience a tremendous amount of scaling when we uh, begin introducing more dynamically driven experiences because of this separate Drupal 7 instance that we've set up exclusively to handle those experiences. And the way Akamai with the ESIs allows us to reach back into that infrastructure will, will, will help us scale in a, in a much easier and streamlined way. One, one quick follow-up question. What percentage of your traffic do you expect to come from authenticated users when you launch that? Uh, right now, we're, we're looking at approximately uh, 7 to 8 percent. Um, obviously, we'd like to increase that. Um, it, you know, t we're, we're thinking 25 to 35 percent might be authenticated. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. I had a small question. Can you explain the, the SEO reason for the node ID slash title? And then also the bigger question was, you talked about the, the enterprise content library. And that sounded kind of static, the way you had it set up. Um, we're doing something kind of similar, but it's, it's, it's sort of to be for our different channels where all of our different people um, who aren't technical people can update our digital assets. And that's more of an active thing to, let, to like push out to our various sites through feeds. Are you guys looking at doing anything like that? or? Okay, so there are two questions here. The first is our URL structure and why we decided to use NID slash title rather than content type slash title. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rocket science in that answer. Everyone knows that SEO has a little, you know, black magic in it and, you know, you can't really can't figure it out to be perfect. Uh, we were advised by our SEO experts that putting the content type in the URL really did nothing to boost SEO and that it was more important to have the title rather than uh, two conflicting strings that, uh, that the SEO engines wouldn't necessarily, or the SEO processes in the search engines wouldn't necessarily understand. The second question, as I understand it, relates to our continuous migration process. So I'm going to allow Christopher to, to answer that. Um, that has to do with our enterprise content, li content library and how data flowed from our legacy system into our Drupal system. Yeah, you mentioned that you thought that the enterprise content library was somewhat static. Uh, yeah, we didn't consider the ECL as a, you know, a staging environment. Uh, Drupal natively is built so that the editors and content managers are actually working on the live stack. And we actually thought that was a win for us. I know a lot of people feel differently. Uh, but our old system was a preview live system where we had preview environment, you see what it's going to look like in the preview, you push it out to the live, and then you see what it's going to look like in live. And one of the things that we felt was a big win for our editors and their contentment with their job was to be able to like make a change and it's live. Uh, granted, there's also cache busting, busting issues that, that we deal with there too. So we really did want to keep the enterprise content library somewhat static. Um, we pretty much set up a principle for that that you know, we haven't followed you know, perfectly, but we basically did, we didn't want any manual process on that Drupal instance. We have scripts that run on it that uh, uh, will take unique IDs between two content types and create a node reference between them, for example, on an automated basis. And we have, of course, the continual import of new content and so forth. But we really wanted to keep it kind of as a repository. Uh, and, you know, at some point, we may very well just take it out of our system if we don't need it anymore. We didn't want to make it part of our sort of future workflow. Um, although we've found it useful for all sorts of other things in the meantime. I might also tack on an answer to, to what uh, Ira was talking about earlier. So, uh, as Mark was mentioning, our content appears in several different places. It's not like there's a recipe on one page and one page only. That recipe can exist in a content gallery and uh, you know, in, in, on a tout. So our URL, the our SEO strategy, also employs not just the node ID and the title, but also where on the site and in what context is this recipe appearing? So that's some of what we were doing there. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, with regards to the more elaborating on SEO and related to the Russian doll hierarchy, and I mean, you talked about how you switched and the SEO implications there, but after that, and in this, I presume, new hierarchy that you have on the new site, 
if you could elaborate a little bit further. For example, I noticed it seems like you've grouped all the recipe content in one subdirectory. You know, any, any other you know, things like that that you can mention? Mark, you I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, do you understand it, Mark? Yeah, you know. Okay, all right. I'll let you, I'll let you repeat. I, ho I hope so. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the question is r related to SEO and the structure of our content yeah. uh, and how we handle that when we yeah, display this. Switch, right? Yeah. right, so, um, well, first off, I should say that none of us up here are SEO experts. Luckily, we have uh, people that we work with that are. Um, so, but uh, maybe, hopefully, this is a good enough answer for now, but um, we kind of, our view from the beginning was that we wanted to have the Flickr model. So, you know, on Flickr, you have a photo, and it has its own individual page, but you could also have that same photo in a gallery, in a set, in, so they're dealing with some of these same uh, ideas thematically that we are. So, um, we wanted to have in our URLs a, a similar fashion, so when you uh, go to a recipe, you see an ID slash title. When you go to that same recipe, but in a gallery, you see recipes slash, or an ID slash title of the recipe, and then uh, we use the Perl module, uh, persistent URL, to then add on, uh, it would be at, photo ga at content gallery, and the NID and title of the, photo, of the content gallery. So we've got all those elements in the URL, so hopefully that helps us with SEO. But we didn't want to have, we wanted to incorporate all those elements and bring it together so it's not this totally different experience. It is the recipe. It's just being displayed in a different way. Uh, uh, the canonical tag plays right. a role there too. Because, uh, mm -hmm. We have the canonical tag, canonical meta, meta tag, indicates the canonical URL that piece of content. In that case, you have the trouble, you don't have to worry about duplicate, you know, duplicate, duplicate content, content problems if Google penalizes you. And so that's always pointing to, if you're viewing a recipe in a gallery, the canonical tag on that page is actually pointing to the standalone recipe page. A couple of questions in regards to the workflow uh, that you were talking about. I've had a couple projects where I've used workflow quite a bit, and I'm curious to see if, in, I'm guessing you did, in the course of this project, if you evaluated workflow versus workbench and the reasons for choosing workflow. And second of all, uh, you had made one of your points was to avoid using actions. Now, usually I found it very easy just to write custom actions to plug into workflow transition states, and so I'm curious to see why and, and what you used instead of actions. Okay, well, uh, the question was why we chose Workflow instead of Workbench. Um, when we began this project two years ago, Workbench was not oh. out. So we, were, we, we had no choice. Um, and uh, I believe that Workbench currently is only on Drupal 7, correct? Right. Yeah, so it's not a Drupal 6 module. We, you know, we, were, we were forced into using Workflow. Uh, you know, we're not sorry. It's a great, great set of modules. Um, as far as the, uh, the choice to not use actions, that was really more related to the fact that because of our deployment model and because we wanted everything to be automated and to reduce the necessity to go into user interfaces and change things around. Um, features was just being introduced when we started uh, this development work. We made a decision that we were just going to do everything in code, put as much in code as possible. We do actually call, um, you know, the the do action function at times. Uh, and we, we do engage with the action module, but we just decided not to use the action UI interface and to set up actions to deal with our workflow transitions. We, we just encapsulated everything in code, and that just allowed us to do a little bit more with the workflow hooks and the transitions between states. 